thank you very much. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank the organizers for um, giving me a chance to uh, inviting me to this nice conference and also giving me a chance to talk about some of the work that we're, we're doing in the group. So let's see if this works. Yes. OK. So all of you know that there's a really big problem with antimicrobial resistance. Uh, there's lots of hospital infections, 3 million patients in a year, about 50,000 deaths. 25% of those are colonized in hospitals. Subsequent infection and resistance is rising. So here, this blue line is MRSA. You can see it started, lots of increase. Even enterococci, which have resistant to vancomycin, which is the so-called antibiotic last resort, has emerged and is on the rise. And you can see the proportion of MRSAs in some of the countries within Europe that are quite high. But this problem is not just for Europe, but it is absolutely worldwide. So let's think of antibiotics. So who makes them? Well, they're actinomyces. More than 80% of all commercial uh, antibiotics are produced by actinomyces. Actinomyces are uh, ground-dwelling, gram-positive soil bacteria. You can see a scanning EM picture here. This is the soil, and you can see spores coming out of the soil. Uh, if you take a grow in the lab, a colony of streptomyces or actinomyces, you see some colonies like this growing on an agar plate. On the top, you see these blobs, and these blobs are antibiotics being secreted from the cells. Here, if you cut the colony in half here, and look at it from the side. So here's the agar, and you can see inside a pigmented antibiotic, red pigmented antibiotic being produced. And in this case, it's being retained in the cell. Here are some structures of antibiotics or natural products. You see penicillin to uh, vancomycin. We just talked about vancomycin just now. Daptomycin, this is the last uh, really approved drug. And in fact, I think a lot of people you know already that this year's Nobel pr uh, Prize for Medicine has gone to three people. Two of them, Campbell and Omra, were involved in identifying and developing Avermectin. So this is, drug has an antiparasitic activity and used all over the world. And the last person here, too, was um, awarded because she re-found artemisinin. So she was going through old literature and in the Chinese literature, she found that people used um, a sweet wormwood a plant to uh, cure against uh, malaria. And then so she started extracting um, um, artemisinin. We'll come back to this story in a minute. OK, so the point is that these natural products, they're very diverse in structure. Some can be simple, and some can be very, very uh, complex. Now, the first antibiotic to be discovered was penicillin in around 1940s, so-called the miracle drug in those days. And in the 1960s, we had a really lots of antibiotics found, novel antibiotics. This was the so-called uh, golden age of antibiotics. But then after that, we've had a steady decline. But on the other hand, <coughs> resistance has increased. So why do we have this decrease of antibiotic uh, discovery? Well, some people say that the pharmaceutical companies are no longer interested in natural products development. Why? Well, it doesn't make a lot of money. So if you want to get any drugs onto the market, it costs a lot of money. Antibiotics, usually you take it for two weeks and you're cured. You don't have to take it anymore. If you're suffering from cancer or from heart disease or diabetes, of course, you have to take it for much longer time. And so you can see what's why the pharmaceutical companies don't really want to work on antibiotics anymore. Um, some other people say that, okay, people don't work on these natural products because actually there's nothing to be found out there. We know that's not the case because we've genome sequenced an actinomyces. It's called Streptomyces clavelligeris. This is in fact a commercial producer. It produces something called beta-lactamase inhibitor. So if you take any beta-lactams or amoxicillin or whatever, there will be these beta-lactamase inhibitors in there as well. So when we sequenced this, the first thing that we found, shockingly enough, was that we found 50, in total, 50 potential secondary metabolite gene clusters. Now, clavelligeris is known to produce about five. We know the structures, chemical structures of them. Some we don't know, but we know that they make around five or six. So the rest, the 45, 44 of these gene clusters are either asleep not being transcribed or translated, 
or they're producing in such small quantities that we just cannot identify them. And in fact, it's not atypical for clavulitoris because we've done a global microbial genome analysis and we find there's a lot of secondary metabolite gene clusters out there. So if you look at this green part here, the tall, the bar, if it's as tall, then you see that there's lots of pathways in these organisms. So this is actinobacteria here, and you can see that there's lots of secondary metabolite gene clusters. But in fact, in all of the other microbes, yes, indeed, in fact, they do have secondary metabolite gene clusters. Now, if you look at the blobs, these blobs show you how novel these structures can be. And in fact, the actinomyces, uh, actinobacteria, of course, they have lots of secondary metabolites, but you can see that the blobs aren't as big. It means that they're very similar in class. And in fact, these other microbes might have much more uh, diverse chemical structures. Okay, so we have done a proof of principle trying to awaken some of these clusters. So this is an orphan gene cluster found in a streptomyces species called streptomyces uh, silicolor. Um, this gene cluster was identified right before the genome was sequenced. In fact, we found a few enzymes, but in the end, because of the genome sequence, we could identify the cluster. And in fact, we didn't know that there was a secondary metabolite gene cluster apart from the ones we knew on here. And so what we did was to delete this repressor. And by doing so, the mutant started producing this yellow color. The parent usually use, uh, produces blue color, and now it's producing this yellow color. And in fact, we could also show that this gene cluster was responsible for a compound that has antimicrobial activity. So this is showing a bioassay that we typically do for looking at antimicrobial activity. So you put a lawn of bacillus, this is gram positive, and then if you see a halo like this, it means that this streptomyces here, this is a patch of streptomyces, is producing a compound that's killing off bacillus. In fact, uh, the yellow compound, the structure has been elucidated by Greg Jealous's group, and you can see that it is absolutely a novel structure. So you can imagine, going back to this figure, you know, if we could awaken all of these potential secondary metabolite gene clusters, we're surely to have novel activity and surely find novel, diverse chemical structures. But if to do this, how are, we going, how are we going to do this? If I have to delete one gene or activate a promoter or take all these heterologous pathways into a, a different a host, it just really doesn't work. It really never works. And of course, it's time consuming. So we want something that's more systematic, something we can do high throughput, and we can design. And of course, we want to use synthetic biology. So there was a lot of definition about definitions on synthetic biology for the past few days. My definition for synthetic biology is that it's going to be the next industrial revolution. It's going to be the biotech 2.0. And basically, it's to engineer new life forms with unrestrained versatility, which means that your imagination is the limit for using synthetic biology. Some of the uh, examples I want to uh, also show you, because this, I think, gives you a flavor of synthetic biology. You'll be hearing from Jeff later on tomorrow about synthetic uh, genomes. And of course, you know the story about uh, Craig Venster Institute using the making the genome from mycoplasma. So you can actually synthesize chromosomes. Uh, but one of the favorite projects that I like to uh, give as an example is those from the iGEM competition. So for those of you who don't know what iGEM is, iGEM stands for International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition. So this happens every year. It's done by undergraduate students. There's more than 300 teams, international teams, coming together to compete every, um, around October time. So the undergraduate students work over the summer period to produce our microbes, usually microbes, sometimes eukaryotes, using standard parts. So here's a little bit of an example. For example, Heidelberg, at one year, produced an E. coli that could recycle gold from electronic waste. Uh, Groningen University, they made a bacillus subtilis, which is uh, a biosensor for rotten food. So, you know, we do have sell-by dates on the foods we, we buy, but that 
doesn't really co correspond to the real use-by date. You don't know if it's okay or gone off. And of course, we waste so much food now. What they wanted to do was to really have some indicator, by sensor, where you can actually really know whether this food is edible or not. And they took meat as an example. So they engineered the bacillus, it turns blue or purple if the meat has gone off. And they actually made a prototype. So they had spores of bacillus surrounded by media in two little plastic kind of chassis. And if you wanted to activate it, you kind of squish it so that the media touches the bacillus and then you put it on your meat. And if you put it on rotten meat, it absolutely went purple. So this is some of the ideas that they have. So I think these iGEM projects give you a really good idea of what one can do with synthetic biology. Another example, of course, all of you know who are synthetic biologists, is about this artemisinin. So this is work from Jay Kiesling's group, and I just spoke about, a little bit about before because this is the uh, Nobel Prize. Not Jay, but the lady who found artemisinin got the Nobel Prize. So artemisinin is made from sweet wormwood, and what Jay wanted to do was to produce it in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Why? Because for plants, the production rate is not always consistent. If the weather's good, you get lots of plants. If the weather's bad, you don't get much plants, okay? And also, it's time consuming to get. You need lots of plants to be able to get a lot of compound. So he decided to take some enzymes, using enzymes from yeast itself, but also some from plants, and to make a precursor of ar artemisinin, which is called artemisinic acid, and then using semi-synthesis to get the end product. So this has already been on the market. It's actually free uh, since, I think, two years ago now. So people, it has been distributed to people who have malaria. Another example I want to bring up is vanillin. So, Everyone knows about vanilla. Vanilla is a mixture of uh, tastes, and the main component is called vanillin, and here's the structure. So the real natural extract only takes 1% of the market. It's very, very expensive. So all of the ice creams and biscuits and whatever you eat that has vanilla flavor is produced from lignin or coal tar. Okay. So a company called Evolva said, okay, why can't we make vanillin in yeast. And that's exactly what they did. And they have now produced vanillin in yeast. And I think last year they already started selling it. Uh, they, they're aiming for 75% of the market. So that would be great if they can get that far. Now at this point, I wanted to bring this up because I know that Paul talked a little bit about it, but I think it's something as a synthetic biologist, I don't know if it's to do with mathematics, you get to this problem as well. but the uh, problem about public perception. We had a lot of, of uh, problems when the genetic modified uh, plants came out. We don't really want to do this again. But you can quickly see that how the NGOs, this is in uh, Friends of the Earth, I think, pick up all these kind of new developments. It's something we have to be aware of. We should be able to talk with the people, engage with the NGOs, and try to say, look, you know, we're not really doing something bad. We're not trying to, to harm the environment. In fact, it's the other way around. Because instead of chemically synthesizing vanillin, we're trying to make it from microbes, which is going to be much better for the environment and not going to be toxic to the environment as well. So I think this is something that we really should keep in mind about engaging the public. So the two examples, artemisinin and vanillin, it's great that they did this. That, you know, we can make these compounds now for using microbes in, in, in large scale as well. But one thing that my group wants to do is to take this even one step further. We want to produce compounds that nature's not seen before by using synthetic biology. And this is in terms of antibiotics. And well, how would we do this? Okay, of course, we would use the design, build, test, and learn cycle concept. And this concept will be in different levels. So for example, we were talking about parts. So parts is enzymes, promoters, ribosome binding sites, terminators. Uh, any of these components, we would design first using in silico uh, analysis. We can predict them. We can do pre uh, simulations. And only those that we think is going to be the best enzyme, the best activity, 
we go off and build them. And once you build it, of course, you need to test it to see if it actually works. And this, of course, if it works, if it doesn't work, will feed back into the design again. And then on the devices level, one can model the pathways, we can design the pathways, the biosynthesis pathways, how do we want it? What kind of ribosomal binding sites do we want? How strong do we want it? Again, we can simulate it and then only use the ones that we think are going to be the best, build it uh, physically. And then once you build it, of course, you need to go off and analyze it. And in this case, we can do an untargeted metabolomic analysis, which means that we look at the metabolite that the cell is producing as a whole. And of course, from this, we can go back into the design and rebuild it so that we get the best pathway. Sorry. On the systems level, this is the cell level. Okay? We can again design and model genomes and then to take those predictions, actually build those chassis, uh, deleting enzyme pathways, uh, making more of them, so on and so forth, and then again testing them. And in this case, we want to scale it up into bioprocessing. And in fact, natural products is wonderful to use synthetic biology because it's naturally modular. We talked about modules, uh, modularity before in this, uh, uh, the talks, but in fact, antibiotics is naturally modular, modular. And how is it? Well, I'll show you an example here of erythromycin biosynthesis. The core gene, uh, the core structure, this is the core structure of erythromycin, requires three huge open reading frames. There could be about 100 kb large. Within these open reading frames, you have modules. Within the modules, you have domains. And these domains are these blobs. And in fact, the domains have the catalytic activity. And what happens is it's very similar to a fatty acid biosynthesis. It takes a C3 unit, loads it onto here, so you have this structure here. The next module loads another C3 and does a bit of enzyme activity, does this, and then another and another. So you elongate this fatty acid chain. And at the end, an enzyme tells you to cleave it off, cyclize it, and then it has some sugar modifications, and you get your erythromycin. And you can see from here that there's modularity here and on this level as well. And because it's modular, now we can kind of cut and paste and mix things up and start thinking, how can we change the actual end compound? So exactly how do we want to do this? How do we want to use synthetic biology for antibody production? First of all, we go to the, all the genomes. It doesn't have to be microbial. It can be from eukaryotes, anywhere, as long as we can find the genomes. We want to identify these secondary metabolite gene clusters. We also want to identify enzymes that has special activity. We want to change the enzyme activity. We want to change the substrate specificities. And then we want to bring all these enzymes together to, with a promoter, ribosome binding sites, terminators, perhaps even regulatory circuits. But at this point, what's biggest difference from uh, something like a uh, biosynthesis that's been done before is to actually rewrite the DNA. So if up to now we've been reading the DNA, using uh, DNA sequencing, now we want to rewrite it using uh, genome synthesis. Once you rewrite your complete DNA uh, clusters, you want to put this into a screening host, screen for the product that you'd like to identify, and once you've identified that compound, we want to put this into a production host. Because the production host is completely different than a screening host because its primary metabolism will be geared uh, the flux will be changed as well so that we can have large-scale production of the compound of your choice. So when we think about synthetic pathways, what do we exactly need? Okay, we need libraries of enzyme parts because without the enzymes, you really can't make a pathway. You need promoter libraries, different strength, different regulatory promo reg regulated promoters, ribosome binding sites, and then you stick this together. But how are you going to make these libraries? Am I going to do it by hand? Of course not. So what we've done is to des um, design, develop some software uh, to identify secondary metabolite gene clusters. This is called anti-smash, and we're on the third version already. What this software does is you can put the whole genome sequence or any gene clusters, and it will identify, like here, uh, the gene uh, 
by synthesis gene clusters. In this case, this was a genome sequence that was uh, put into the uh, software. It identified 25 by synthesis gene clusters, and then it shows you the open reading frames that you can find, and even the uh, domains as well. And it even predicts the uh, core structure of this biosynthesis gene cluster. So this is a web-based uh, um, software. Here's the website. If you'd like to use it, please do. We're always welcome for feedback, to hear feedback. And if you have some sequences that you don't want to put on the website, you can download the software uh, locally to your desktop and use it yourself. Another software we've designed is called Multi-Gene Blast. It's very similar to Anti-Smash, but the thing is it it's not limited to antibiotic biosynthesis clusters. There are a lot of other gene clusters out there. Uh, for example, membrane-associated uh, differentiation, developmental gene clusters. So this is looking using, if you want to look for any genes that are clustered and are conserved, you can use this software to find it. So using these two softwares, what we've done together with the natural products community is to make a genome annotation standard. Uh, it's an annotation standard, so we can in fact even use it as a database. So we've asked all the natural product products community about all these different antibiotic biosynthesis cluster, classes of antibiotics, all these kind of different questions, and we've asked them to put them onto our uh, database. And here, What's the good thing about it is that if you find a new biosynthesis cluster and it's similar to something, you can go into MIBIG and actually identify the publications that's been there, what kind of experiments that's been done, who's been doing it, and all these kind of, of uh, information. Anyone working on natural products, if you'd like to uh, join us, please do. We're very happy to have you on board. Okay. So another software we've designed or developed is on the devices level. That means we're going to the pathway level. So this is using mass, oops, sorry, mass spec data that you get for peptide natural products and linking them with a genome sequence so we can actually identify which is the biosynthetic pathway and predicting that biosynthetic pathway. We've also done some systems level design and this is using um, modeling, meta metabolite modeling. So there was lots of things about modeling. Um, perhaps I can show you how modeling actually uh, connects with design and the testing of uh, experiments. So in this case, uh, what we've done is a constraint based model of all these different actinomyces strains. And the question that we wanted to ask was which chassis, which strain is going to make a lot of my antibiotic? And so here down here you see different classes of natural products, antibiotics, and the lighter the color, the better the host can produce it. Okay? So here is streptomyces here. So streptomyces are the ones that produce a lot of these natural products. And in fact, if you look across, okay, so for some classes it's a very good host, but for others not very good. Now, if you go down a little bit further down here, you can see that this is a very good host for a lot of different compounds. And in fact, these are mycobacterium species, not the pathogenic ones, but the uh, natural uh, wild type strains. So of course, this is only in silico analysis. We need to go back into the lab and test this, whether this is true. And that's exactly what we're doing now. Another design uh, software modeling that we've done, computational analysis we've done, is on regulatory networks. So we have some um, small molecules that we think are regulatory compounds for antibiotic production. And if we, if we fact, in fact, we've been able to show that it's a bistable switch for antibiotic production. And we've also used the uh, constraint-based metabolite modeling to try and understand flux. So what we did this was use Streptomyces clavuligeris, the genome sequence that I talked to you about before. We had transcriptome data for the wild type and the high producer of beta-lactamase inhibitor. So we put these two transcriptomes data together with the metabolite uh, modeling and asked which pathways do we need for the high producer or we don't need for the high producer. And in fact, all the green pathways, the metabolite pathways, are those that are redundant in a high producer, which means that we can minimize the metabolite pathway, redirect the flux, and at the same time, minimize 
the genome as well. Okay, now that we've designed our parts, we've got software that we can do, use to make our uh, enzymes and pathways, we have to think, okay, how are we going to build them? The first question I had was, can we actually make enzyme libraries and can I swap enzymes around? And to understand this, we used uh, the biosynthesis cluster that produces the calcium-dependent antibiotic. This is a, a non-ribosomal peptide uh, antibiotic. You can see all the amino acids are linked together. And it uses one um, amino acid called L-hydrophenylglycine. And in fact, because it's not being produced by the organism, it needs the three biosynthesis enzymes embedded into the biosynthesis cluster to produce this compound. So, we took a look at this enzyme here and asked the question, can we swap it around? Can we, is there orthologs? Is there homologs? In fact, there are homologs and orthologs unrelated from uh, actinomyces. To test whether these enzymes can actually replace the original enzyme, we deleted the enzyme, original HGMO from the producer strain and then complemented these six genes or enzymes. And you can see over here in this panel, we tested to see if they have bioactivity. Again, this is a lawn of bacillus and the halo means that it's killing the bacillus. So yes, it has antimicrobial activity, it's producing something, but to make absolutely sure that it's a calcium dependent antibiotic, we did a LCMS and show that it was indeed the compound that we're after. So this tells me and gives me a uh, good idea that yes, we can do this. Now it's really, we can make library of enzymes to make antibiotics. The next thing to think about, if I have the enzyme parts, now I want to put them together, okay? So what's the order that I should put them together? Remember, we're completely rewriting this. We're coming up from scratch. So we decided to use a test case for these six uh, enzymes, which produces this compound here. This is the natural orientation of the genes and the promoters that's found in streptomyces. But if you think about it, because you're gonna rewrite it, it doesn't have to be like this. It can be like this with each promoter in front of each enzyme. It can be coupled with only three. It can be in all sorts of directions. So if you start thinking about this, you have thousands of combinations that one has to <laughs> test to see whether which one, which pathway, which orientation, which combination is going to be the best. That's a lot of work. I, don't, I didn't want my PhD student to spend all his time making lots of these constructs. So what we did was to go back to nature. Nature's been using evolution to get the best out of uh, producing compounds. So can we learn something from nature? So these are five different biosynthesis clusters which make a very similar compound to this. What we found out was there was two enzymes here, two genes that are always, always next to each other. And in fact, these are two proteins that have protein-protein interaction and you can't split them. And so now we can use this rule to start off with and say, okay, these two enzymes always have to be together and then carry on and start making manipulations. And doing this, we can try and we're learning what is the best way of constructing a pathway, what's the best promoter strengths, what are the rules that we need to follow to actually design these pathways. We're also doing uh, this refactoring, building pathways using another compound, which is monoterpenes. So as you saw from the uh, previous slides, antibiotics are a very complex structure. So we wanted to use something that's a little bit more simple. And for that, we decided to use something uh, called monoterpenes. So monoterpenes, in this case, this is limonene. Uh, sorry, it's, it's uh, covered up a bit now. So monoterpenes are used for flavor and fragrances like mint, flavors, lots of the smells, lemon smells, grapefruit, all of these are uh, very close to monoterpenes. So what we've done now is to, and monoterpenes, by the way, is made from plants, not from microbes. So what we had to do is to get enzymes from the plants and also using some from uh, microbes as well to produce this limonene, so all these enzymes here. What Adrian's done is to put these pathways together, and of course we had the challenge, just like Jay did, how do we put them together? What's the best way of putting them together? What's the promote, how about the promoter strengths? Does it have to be always very strong or does it not have to be strong? So Adrian made two different constructs like this and decided and started testing them. Of course, we tested for translation 
here as well and test it for different strengths of promoters. And then also induction levels because these promoters have, can be induced by different uh, compounds. He looked at induction levels. And to cut the long story short, what we find is strong is not always good. It looks as though the promoters that are a bit weaker is much better than having very, very strong promoters. In fact, this is still on a plasmid, and this is an E. coli, by the way. Um, and the plasmid is, is quite a high copy number plasmid. What we're doing now is actually putting this onto the genome to make it much more stable, and also it seems that it works much better this way. Okay, so we've written the uh, genes, we've made the pathways, and is that all it is for synthetic biology? In fact, it isn't. There's other things we can do, other things we can engineer. Some of the things we can do in terms of spatial control, we can make synthetic protein scaffold or compartments, making compartments. We had a speaker in the first day about talking about compartments. We can also make microbial consortia. So if we want to use synthetic biology for industrial biotech, really make it cheap. We have to have it cheap. The end product has to come down in price. And the process has to come down in price. A lot of the things that people are thinking about now is not using glucose as carbon source, but rather lignin or other uh, waste products. And for that, we can use some microbes which are very good in degrading these things, converting into glucose, and giving it to somebody else who can do, for example, biofuel production. So these are the ideas for microbial consortia. So one of the things that, that we're doing in my group is making compartments. And you've heard already uh, nicely about the compartments. So I don't have to, to iterize now, but just the idea that if we want to express a pathway, it's much more nicer to happen in a compartment because the intermediates don't get degraded. If you have toxicity, you can uh, overcome that. So what we're using is a microbial, uh, bacterial micro compartment, BMC, from uh, UT, um, EUT. So what this compartment does naturally is to degrade ethylenoamine. But what we want to do is get rid of this pathway here and just make this core uh, empty shell. And we can do this by expressing these five enzymes. And into this uh, empty shell, what we want to do is to express monoterpenes. Now, monoterpenes are volatile compounds, and this is all done, work done in E. coli. And if you try to express lots or produce lots of monoterpenes, E. coli just dies. It just cannot uh, cope anymore. So the idea is to put this uh, biosynthesis cluster into the uh, BMC shell, encapsulate it so the E. coli is not so toxic, and it can grow much better. So Ash has already made these constructs. In fact, we have some preliminary uh, evidence to see that we can see um, these BMCs being made in E. coli. Another thing we're trying to do is what you need is a tag to encapsulate them, uh, these enzyme into the empty shell. And we've been able to synthesize some of these uh, target uh, sequences. And Ash is also testing these as well. OK, another level of things that we can do in synthetic biology is to control its expression. <laughs> So it can be a very fast control, like an allosteric control, or just just in time, so you only have the genes expressed when you want them. Or you can have signaling molecules which can synchronize the cell growth. So in our group, we're working on small molecules called gamma butylactones, and these are found in actinomyces, or streptomyces, in fact. And if you look at the structure, you can see that it's very similar to acyl homoserine lactones. So AHLs have been used as regulatory circuits very well in E. coli. And what we'd like to do is to use this as an alternative to AHL or complementary to AHL regulatory circuits. So Mark is, is starting to use this circuit into uh, E. coli and see how far we can uh, produce a, a nice regulatory circuit to be used. OK. So now we've designed everything, we've built our uh, pathways, we've built our chassis. So now we're going to produce everything fine in huge amounts. But normally it doesn't work like that. And um, if you're engineering a chair or a shelf, it's the same. Even with computers or cars, sometimes you need to tweak it. And so our favorite way of tweaking is metabolomics. Uh, and we're using the untargeted metabolite analysis using the high precision LCMS. And to 
to show that metabolomics really actually does work, we've done a proof of concept uh, experiment, and this is actually inducing an antisense glutamine synthetase. So what it does is when you induce it, it stops growth. So you make a synthetic switch. And this is the wild type, this is the switch. And at all these time points, we actually um, got all the metabolites and looked to see how the metabolite profiles change. I think uh, you were saying that you can only do seven experiments. Well, we did lots. So you can see here, we did five, uh, six biological replicates, that's the growth curves. Within the six biological replicates, we had five time points each. And then we had two LCs, uh, two different LCs, and we had the positive and negative mode as well, and we did three technical replicates. So that's quite a lot of samples that we tested. But by doing this, we could actually see a trend. Though it gives you a variability in lots of, uh, from each of these uh, samples, you see variability. But if you do lots, enough of them, you can in fact see a trend. And you can see some of the compounds, like this one here, is immediately reacting to the synth uh, induction. So is this one. While other compounds, amino acids here, are only uh, changing when there is a stop in growth. So these are all the metabolites that we saw that changed okay, by perturbing this. This is the antisense glutamine synthetase. So we don't really understand why this happens. But one thing we can say is that all, metabolomics is a great debugging tool because it shows us the cell, what's happening in the cell as a whole. Okay, so what do we need for synthetic biology and antibiotics production? We need parts by synthesis, genes from different sources. We need to engineer the chassis, circuits, control of gene expression, not just on transcription, but translational levels. We need lots of computational software and modeling and analysis that feeds back into the building. And we need to have these analytical um, routes. And of course, this shows you the design and build test concept, we really need to do this over and over again. And in fact, this is not just for antibiotics. It can be used for any high value chemicals or functional metabolites. And at this point, this was my group, my intention of doing it as a group. So there's one PhD student or a postdoc work on different um, things. But to get it to the next level, we need to do this high throughput in a much larger scale. And to do this, we're doing this in our Synthetic Biology Research Center. So we've been uh, awarded from the BBSRC and EPSRC, the research center, which we call Symbiochem, which is on fine and specialty chemicals. And of course, we're taking the uh, design, build, test cycle concept, and it's housed in this building here called MIB in Manchester. So what do we want to do? We want to access wide range of chemical diversity, rapid uh, delivery, and of course we want it to be predictable. And we're using this design build test cycle and platforms. In fact, we can do this in Manchester because we have a lot of expertise. So we have lots of these, all these are PIs, professors who are involved in our center. There are people like Doug Kell, uh, John Loop, and Pedro Mendes, who are systems biology experts. Uh, we have Nigel and Nick Turner, Turner, who's our biocatalysis experts. We have also Jason, who's an expert in antibiotic production. Uh, let's see, we also have uh, Roy and Perdita, who's uh, absolutely experts in uh, mass spec and GCs. So because we have all these expertise in-house. This is the reason why we can actually get this center up and running. And so what we've done with the center is to get the money that we received, we've made a platform. All the money has gone for equipment. These are the, all the new equipment, analysis equipment that we have, also making, getting lots of robotics and uh, design softwares. And of course, to run all these softwares, we need people and here, we have now uh, 12 SEOs appointed. N Neil is upstairs as well. He's got a poster on a little bit more about the design of this, what we're doing in the design platform. Please have a look at the poster. It's on the, over here. Uh, so we have also people in place. And 
So now our ambition now is to take this into really a higher level, making it into a production level so that we can even have real collaboration, collaboration with the industry and to have a product in the end from synthetic biology. And last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge all the people involved, people in the group, Symbiochem team as well, Nigel's group. Uh, all these people here are uh, informaticians. I have a very good uh, collaboration with the informaticians. And I have a, a project with uh, companies as well looking for novel antibiotics and here also on the monoterpene project. And I'd also like to thank all the funding bodies and thank you for listening. Hey, thank you very much. I think there's time for a few technical questions. <coughs> The microbes from biology, you still have your gold in your teeth. Sorry, the gold, <laughs> gold in my teeth. teeth. Yes. Because you said the microbes taking out the gold from the electric. Ah, right, right, right. Yes. yes. Ah, yes. Social uh, uh, embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> May I ask one question just to fine tune what you get? Can you couple it with selection mechanism for bacteria? I couple the selection. Yeah, you can couple it with selection for bacteria to, to fine tune what you get, yeah, because you get it roughly and then you want to fine tune. For example, against given pathogen, you want to make antibiotics and to make circuit with a, with a selection. Is it possible to make it? To make a circuit. Circuit, yeah, of course, you have electronics analysis and then there is a selection for bacteria and then they go together. Yes, it's why not? to make a coupling of those, right? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Circuit, as in circuit in the microbe, right? right. That's what you're saying. No, you know, okay, you have your software, you prepare this, then you make exactly. selection and then see what, what happens, yeah. make analysis yeah. and repeat yeah. it yeah. in yeah. the cycle. Yeah, so the, the idea is really right. designing something, right. building it, and then testing it and coming back right. and doing it. So we had some discussions in the but previous sections. Specifically selection. Yes, you, you, ha you need to have a good selection. You right. need to know what you want. If you don't know that, then you can't do this. No, but you, want, you don't know exactly the shape of a chemical, but you know what pathogen you Exactly, want to exactly. So that's right. It's easy to organize selection schema. That's right, that's yeah. right, that's keep, right. Keep the microphone. Any more questions? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, about the bio compartment or the mini compartment strategy. So you, you want to produce a toxic end product. <coughs> And this is supposed to accumulate in those compartments That's because, right. in a That's way, right. it's just postponing the death. Of yes, them. but then, even postponing it, you get more cell mass, and then you can produce more. Are there compartments That's that you could actually kick out of the cell? Um, not not these BMCs, but then on, on another way, you can kind of purify them a bit easier as well too. You can try and extract them, but the most important thing is actually just even this delaying helps with the cell mass. It's just getting much more biomass because if you don't have biomass, you don't get production. So that's the, the bit idea. Okay, well, to make a little remark, the first antibiotic for the perfect use was not penicillin, but gramicidin, produced by Dubo a couple of years before Florian to make penicillin. Uh -huh. Gramicidin. Yes. Yeah, it was. It's not before penicillin. Yeah. So can we make it? You no, mean? no, it was made before yeah. penicillin. The first was not penicillin. Ah, okay, okay, okay. That's what you mean. Okay, 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 okay. 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 Yeah. yeah. Well, identified. Let's say identified, yeah. not produced, but identified. No, identified. They were penicillin identified a long time ago. Before, you know, in 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 nineteenth century, it was a name. Fleming gave the name to penicillin, uh -huh. right? But therapeutic use came in in thirty nine by gramicidin and forty one for penicillin. Penicillin was only given a name, to us as a it was known there for for ages. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes. Thank you. It's tricky history. Yeah. 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 Okay. But, yeah. but for therapeutic use, it, kind of, it was first penicillin was a couple of years before penicillin. Uh -huh. ah, okay. Penicillin, I guess. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I have actually a, a question, brief question. If you if you want to produce antibiotics or, or look for new antibiotics, usually you find a lot of them. <coughs> which inhib inhibit the growth of other organisms, prokaryotes, but most of them cannot be used because they have negative side effects on humans. Is there something in your procedure which tries to, to take this into account that you do not develop hundreds of, of potential sure. candidates with <coughs> no chance? It's all to do with the screening method. Of course, yeah. you can put in lots of different screening methods. I just put antimicrobial because it's the easiest, but of course you can put in toxicity screening and all this in there as well too. So the nice thing about this is flexible. It, whatever you want to do, you can plug into it. Okay. There is no universal way to find toxicity. It's only experimentally. 
I mean, toxic, there is no chemical way to say whether it's toxic or not. No, of course not. That's why you need to do screening, like using mammalian cells or whatever, yeah. Mm. And then we have quite very different for different organisms. Penicillin is toxic, for example, for... Yes, for that's right. So yeah. some, some industries want broad spectrum, some want very narrow spectrum. So it, it depends on what you use as a screening. Okay, then thanks again.